Number 1. Pamela was last seen in Atwater, California on September 13, 1982. She was last seen in the morning hours, after she was dropped off at school. She was seen speaking to an unidentified individual on a payphone in the front area of her school. She was never seen again. Her mother arrived at the school at approximately 1.30 p.m. to pick Pamela up, but she was nowhere. She waited until 2 p.m. and then asked the school to page her. Pamela did not respond to the page, and her mother contacted her father. Pamela was reported as a missing person at 4.30 p.m. Investigators refused to take her report because they needed to wait approximately 24 hours to declare someone as missing. She has never been seen or heard from again. She hasn't used her social security number since the time she went missing, and the circumstances of her disappearance are unclear. At the time of her disappearance, Pamela lived on Rainbow Lane with her parents and younger brother. She was a senior student at Atwater High School and had plans of graduating early. She also a classical pianist and has a black belt in karate and was into aerobics at the time. Pamela's father has since died and her mother has since moved to Oregon and remarried. She continues to search for her daughter and hopes for answers in her disappearance. Some agencies classify Pamela's disappearance as an endangered runaway and state she disappeared from Merced, California on September 13, 1986. Merced police are investigating her disappearance. Her date of birth might be listed as September 21, 1965, and her age as 16 with some agencies. Her disappearance remains unsolved. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Merced County Sheriff's Office 209-385-7444. Number 2. Stephen was last seen in Remsen, New York on April 12, 1976. He was last seen by his five companions, T. Mark Seymour, James Thackerberry, Ken Sherwood, Robert Bromley and Bruce Weaver. They were all hiking up Mount Marcy, attempting to reach the summit of the mountain. They climbed until they were approximately two miles away from the summit at Alinon. The group decided to stop here and build camp and fires to keep warm. The area had temperatures of 10 degrees and it was quite windy that day, the snow on the ground was hard enough to walk on. At 3.30 p.m., Thomas drank some tea before he said he was going to walk on the trail. His companions initially believed that he was simply walking to see how much longer they had until they would reach the summit. They weren't concerned until it started to get dark. By the time dark had reached, Steve had not returned, and winds of up to 60 mph started and snow came down hard. Some people from the group set out with flashlights in search of Steve. When they couldn't find him, and the weather became too hard to look through, they returned to the campsite and waited until the next morning. The group set out the next morning in search of Steve, they did not get a ranger, because it would take hours to hike for one and they believed that since Steve didn't have much winter gear on, he was in critical danger. They searched for him right away. The group split up and searched the summit and surrounding trails for him. The snow was concrete hard and they could not find any footprints of his. At 3 p.m., three of the teenagers from the group hiked to seek help from authorities. They went to a police station and reported Stephen as missing. Searchers reaches the area by the morning of April 14 and afterwards, one of the most extensive searches ever conducted on Mount Marcy occurred. Despite a rise in temperature to 83 degrees, no sign of Steve or his body was ever found. Various theories regarding Steve's fate have come to investigators' minds over the years. One was that Thomas had fallen into a gorge and broke his leg or became injured in general. He might have also stepped off the trail and into a spruce trap which is a deep cavity in the earth hidden by snow. At the elevation that Thomas was in, the snow is deep enough to where it covers treetops, hikers can unknowingly step into this and fall 15 feet under the snow and became entangled in branches. If the snow were to fall on them before they climbed out, searchers would not be able to locate them. After two weeks of searching the mountain, some came to the possibility that Steve simply walked down the Hopkins Trail and passed his companions. He could have gone to Route 73 and hitchhiked his way to another town with a new name. Investigators and his family do not believe he left on his own accord. He was close to his family and grandparents at the time and would never hurt them by doing so. He would have been open about moving if he had any plans to do so. Despite the belief that Stephen was dead, his family continued to search for him in the mountains. In July of 1976, they found a sleeping bag, a pair of boots, a shotgun, and the skeletal remains of a male in his late teens or early twenties. 
The body was identified as missing camper, George Atkinson. He disappeared while camping in the area in March of 1973. Stephen remains missing. His family hopes to find and recover his remains. He is presumed to have gotten lost and perished in the mountains. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact New York State Police 518-897-2000. Number 3. Diane was last seen in Kenwick, Washington on June 18, 1985. She was last seen leaving her family's residence to join a friend, 21-year-old Molly A. Purden. Both girls were last seen in the late afternoon hours in the King County, Washington area. Robbins and Purden had plans of meeting friends in Seattle, Washington at the time. Neither was ever seen again. A month after they disappeared, Molly's body was discovered off Index Galena Road near Millip Estate in King County, Washington. She was killed from a blow to the head. Both girls were presumed to have left on their own accord until Molly's body was found. No trace of Diane was found at the location that Molly was found in, but investigators believe she was killed along with her. Investigators have looked at the possibility that Diane's disappearance and Molly's murder might be related to disappearances and murders of several women from the same area as them. Several of these women had a connection to prostitution except for Diane. Investigators believe a serial killer was operating in the area at the time and was responsible for at least several of these cases. About a year before her disappearance, Diane accused her father, Ellsworth Robbins, of raping her. He was convicted of his act against his daughter and her mother, Dunger Nancy Robbins, separated from him afterwards. There is no evidence that links anyone in her family to her disappearance. Diane's mother took her own life in 1991. Her older half-brother, Steve Robbins, was last known to be living in the state of Michigan and has become a motivational speaker and professor. Diane's disappearance remains unsolved and she is believed to be the victim of foul play. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Benton County Sheriff's Office 509-735-6555. Number 4. James was last seen in Titusville, Florida on December 20, 1987. He and his 39-year-old father, James Matthew Muhlmans, left Port Canaveral at approximately 6.30 a.m. on a fishing expedition in a 21-foot gas-powered Chris Craft boat. The captain of the boat was John DeGrose and there was also one additional passenger, Frank Doherty. They were only meant to be gone for 12 hours and were supposed to return by the time night reached. The boat never returned to shore. On December 26, the body of John DeGrose was found about 12 miles off Daytona Beach. In January of 1988, the body of James Muhlmans was found washed ashore. No trace of James and Frank were never found. Investigators have not been able to determine how the boat ran into trouble. John was an experienced SO captain who led multiple fishing trips. The Muhlmans were regular fishermen on his boat. The waters were fine on that day, and nothing has suggested a weather-related incident. The boat was never found despite extensive searches for it. The boat did have a radio, but no one received any distress calls that day. At the time of his disappearance, James was a student at Westridge Middle School and was to attend a Christmas dancing program at Walt Disney World the Monday after his disappearance. He was described as intelligent and full of energy. He was always happy and was full of life. He also loved to fish. James and Doherty have never been found, and investigators believe they are deceased. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Brevard County Sheriff's Office 321-264-5217. Number 5. Michael Mansfield was last seen in Lincoln, Illinois on December 31, 1975. He was last seen at approximately 2 p.m. that day. He was helping his mother prepare for New Year's when the phone in their home rang and he answered it. He then put the phone down and told his mother that he was going out for an hour to meet a friend and left the home. Mansfield never returned home and was never seen or heard from again. He left his wallet at home. Investigators believe that Mansfield was the victim of a homicide. Mansfield vanished exactly six days before he was supposed to testify against Russell Smreaker, his former college roommate. He was accused of stealing a guitar and 80 records from a girl's dormitory on September 18, 1975. He was charged with burglary and petty theft. He was a key witness in the case because he saw Russell bring the stolen goods into their room. Mansfield guesses they were stolen and hid them to avoid getting into trouble. 
When the theft was discovered, Mansfield was initially charged with hiding evidence of the theft, but the charges were dropped in exchange for his testimony. Mansfield had already testified against Russell before the College Judicial Board which ended up expelling him three weeks into his sophomore year. Mansfield was to testify against him in criminal court after he disappeared. The charges against Smreaker were dropped due to lack of evidence without Mansfield's testimony. The year after Mansfield's disappearance, Smreaker allegedly stole two steaks from a Kroger grocery store. He threw the steaks under the car of 51-year-old Ruth Louise Martin as he fled the store. She was to be a witness in that case as well. Ruth vanished on June 2, 1976, and has never been seen again. Smreaker was later convicted of murdering Jay and Robin Fry. Jay was the shore clerk who saw Russell attempting to steal the stakes and was due to testify against him at his trial. Robin was his wife who was pregnant at the time of the murders. Both were found gunned down in their home. Russell was sentenced to 200 to 600 years for the murders. In October of 2011, Smreaker admitted to killing Ruth Martin on the day of her disappearance. He stated that he buried her body under Interstate 55 on the same night. Interstate 55 was under construction at the time of her disappearance. He also confessed to killing Mansfield, but he would not divulge the location of his body. Martin and Mansfield were never found, and Russell was never charged with either case. He died in prison shortly after he confessed. At the time of his disappearance, Mansfield was a student at Lincoln College, but he was home with his parents for the holidays. He lived with them in the 3900 block of Gull Court. He was known to frequent record stores at Woodfield Shopping Center and in Arlington Heights and Chicago, Illinois. He was a good student and made good grades. Michael also worked at the Lincoln College radio station and dreamed of being a radio station music director. He was a 1974 graduate of Rolling Meadows High School. Three of his siblings still live in Illinois, but his parents have since moved to Florida. His mother passed away in October of 2014. His family held a memorial for him in 1998. Michael's remains have not been found, but foul play is suspected in his disappearance. His case is considered closed by investigators. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Rolling Meadows Police Department 847-255-2416. Number 6. Melissa was last seen in Lorden, Virginia on December 3, 1989. That evening, she and her mother, Tammy, attended a holiday party at the Woodside Apartment Clubhouse which was located near their apartment complex. Melissa was shy, so she spent most of her time at the party sitting on Tammy's lap. At 10 p.m., Tammy and Melissa prepared to leave, but the child asked if she could go get a handful of potato chips first. Melissa went back to get the chips, while Tammy waited for her to come back. Melissa never returned to her mother and was never heard from again. Tammy went back into the party to search for her daughter, but was unable to locate her. She found that a window in the utility room was open, and she screamed for help. This was one of the only clues ever found in Melissa's case Tammy called the police and reported her daughter's disappearance. Melissa's case was immediately labeled as a stranger abduction and an immediate search was commenced for her. Police, citizen volunteers, and 300 military personnel all searched for Melissa. Over 35,000 posters of Melissa were distributed by searchers and 10,000 bumper stickers in the Washington, D.C. area. Several local movie theaters previewed a video taken at home of Melissa singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in a Christmas-themed holiday. In addition to search efforts, investigators also posted a $100,000 reward in hopes of finding Melissa, but the search efforts failed to locate the child. Investigators found that there were between 80 to 200 guests at the party on the night of Melissa's abduction, but they were able to quickly narrow down a suspect in the case. Caleb Daniel Hughes immediately became a suspect in the kidnapping. He was in his mid-twenties in 1989 and was recently married. He was a maintenance worker at Melissa's apartment complex. Hughes had been working at the complex for approximately two to three weeks before Melissa's abduction and he lived eight miles away. Several party guests recall how Hughes paid particular attention to Melissa and was even seen speaking to her at one point. He apparently left the party at the exact same time that Melissa was discovered missing. Hughes had a criminal record, but not for sexual assault or kidnapping. He was known to harbor runaway girls during the 1980s. This habit of his ultimately led to him being convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor in the late 1987. He allegedly supplied a 15-year-old with beer. 
investigators weren't able to find Hughes until 1 a.m. the next morning. They looked inside of his washing machine to discover that the outfit he wore that night which included his leather belt, knife holder, and shoes had already been washed. This meant that any trace evidence that might have been on his clothes were gone. There was a massive media response to the Brannon case after her disappearance. Multiple news stations in Washington, D.C. attempted to own the case, and most people who talked about the case on air were extremely emotional about Melissa's abduction and were bitter towards the lead suspect in the case. They felt he should have been in jail at the start for taking Melissa. Investigators searched Hugh's vehicle that he drove in 1989. The vehicle in question was a red or maroon Honda Civic sedan. Investigators recovered fibers from the vehicle. Some of the fibers were blue and appeared to match the sweater that Melissa was wearing on the night of her abduction. They also found rabbit hairs that would have come from Tammy's jacket as well. The evidence from the car proved Melissa had been sitting on the passenger side seat at some point during the night she went missing. Investigators also found bloodstained tissues in the vehicle. Initial testing showed that Melissa could have been a possible source for the blood, but so could 40% of the general population. Subsequent testing showed the blood didn't belong to Melissa. Investigators believe Hughes abducted Melissa, sexually assaulted her, and killed her. They believe she died within three hours of being taken, since most statistics on stranger abductions show the victims die in that time span. Investigators also questioned his wife, Carol, who completely cooperated with authorities about what happened that night. Carol was able to help create a timeline, tracking Hugh's movements throughout the night of Melissa's abduction. She told authorities of how Caleb came home from work several hours later than usual. She also tracked the mileage on their car and noticed that Caleb had driven more than 50 miles on the night of Melissa's disappearance. Hughes was questioned by investigators as to why he took so long in getting home from the party. He told them that he had taken a longer route home and that he stopped at a High's convenience store to purchase a six-pack of beer. Investigators are still trying to determine where the store was located since High's no longer operates in the state of Virginia. He claimed he got home by 12.30 a.m. Investigators have stated that the story was highly improbable to begin with. Liquor stores in Virginia do not sell alcoholic beverages past midnight. There was no way to prove his alibi. In January of 1990, Hughes was arrested for parole violation due to a prior conviction of automobile theft. At the time of Melissa's presumed death, Virginia law did not require a body to convict someone of murder. However, it was required that a proven location of the murder is disclosed which investigators did not have. Therefore, Hughes could not be charged with murder. Hughes was later charged with abduction with intent to defile in relation to Melissa's disappearance. Detectives were able to prove based on evidence that Hughes had abducted Melissa with the intention to molest her. He was convicted of the charges on March 8, 1991, and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. While investigators consisted this a large success in the case, more problems would later arise in the case. In June of 1991, the sentencing process was delayed in the abduction case. A Fairfax County judge delayed her final sentencing ruling in the case after a claim came forward regarding Melissa's disappearance. A Washington lawyer, Hilton Cobb, claimed he saw Melissa alive after her alleged abduction and murder. Hilton was 53 years old at the time and was a Department of Veterans Affairs lawyer when Melissa went missing. He claimed that on December 4, 1989 at approximately 4.20 p.m., he saw Melissa on a train in downtown Washington. He said that a couple was hiding Melissa inside a large coat aboard the train. Cobb stated he contacted authorities on December 5 with the alleged sighting, but that they seemed skeptical of his claim and he was reluctant to get further involved with the case. It should be noted, however, that Cobb was unable to describe the child in a favorable manner and that his reported sighting was not listed among the 200 other possible sightings of Melissa. In 1993, Hughes' conviction was overturned on the basis lack of evidence. There was little to no evidence to prove that Hughes abducted Melissa with the intent of defiling her. He was tried again and was convicted on charges that he abducted her. This could have carried a shorter sentence of 10 years and Hughes could have been paroled immediately, but this didn't occur. Hughes was not the only person charged in the Brannon case. At some point after Melissa went missing, Tammy was called by people claiming they had Melissa in their custody and demanded $75,000 for her safe return. 
An FBI agent posing as Tammy handed the money to a courier whom they eventually followed to an apartment. The apartment was shared by 20-year-old Emmett Muriel Greyer III and 24-year-old Anthony Gerard McRae. They were both charged with extortion 1991. Emmett was sentenced to four years in prison for his role in the crime and Anthony, who devised the entire plan, was sentenced to seven years in prison. They are not considered suspects in the case, and are believed to be opportunists who had nothing to do with Melissa's disappearance. Hughes served nearly 30 years of his original 50-year sentence in Melissa's case. On August 2, 2019, he was released from prison, and is currently living in an undisclosed location, and is required to list as a sex offender. He maintains his innocence in the case, and states he was in no way responsible for the abduction of Melissa. At the time of her disappearance, Melissa lived with her mother in their apartment and Tammy worked as an accountant at the time. They had moved to Northern Virginia following Tammy's divorce with her husband. He lived in Texas at the time of Melissa's disappearance. Her parents helped take care of Melissa when she worked. She worked with a defense contracting company and a jewelry store over the weekends. Tammy was deeply affected by the loss of her young daughter. In the years that followed, Tammy went back to school and completed an MBA. She also got married to a widowed man, Leon Graybill, who had four children himself at the time. Tammy told the media that while she does use her husband's last name, he continues to list her last name as Brandon in the phone book in case Melissa is alive, and she tries to find her mother years later. Police are hopeful to locate Melissa and have continued to search for Melissa throughout the years since 1989. Her case is considered an unsolved homicide and her body has never been found. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Fairfax County Sheriff's Office 703-246-7800, Federal Bureau of Investigation 202324-3000.